Trevor Coopersmith, and I just wanted to um, give some information to new artists. So thank you, Catherine and, and Sydney, for contacting me through the city of Santa Clarita. And I'm going to give everyone a bit of information on um, just sort of how to survive as an artist, uh, new tips for developing your, your practice, and just certain mistakes and stuff that I've sort of made over over the years. Hopefully it'll be a bit beneficial um, to everyone. So just starting out, um, here's a couple photos of uh, my work hung up at the uh, exhibition titled Landscapes of the Mind. So that was set up at the first floor gallery in Santa Clarita. Uh, it was a virtual exhibition and physical, which is nice. And then another photograph of my work um, and my dad's work, who's actually a professional artist, uh, hung up uh, in Arizona at like an outdoor festival. Um, yeah. So during this video, I'm going to be talking about some information um, that may or may not be of everyone's interest, but the basically I'm going to start out with my personal experience. So I'm going to discuss a little bit of background context for me. It doesn't make sense um, for you guys to get that, to, to have that sort of information withheld because I can only speak from my perspective and this video might, like I said, might not pertain to everybody, but if you wanna be a professional artist or if you're in the midst of trying to navigate certain things, it might be worthwhile to hear uh, my story. Um, artistic labor and like the ethics behind it, art education, so bachelor's and master's of art. Um, public art events, which kind of happens to be uh, my, my specialty or my favorite thing to do. Um, the application process for applying to exhibitions and applying to residencies, stuff like that. Um, information about residencies. I'm actually in my studio right now uh, in uh, College Station, Texas, doing my first artist in residence uh, program. Public projects and sales, because everyone wants to hopefully make a little bit of money doing what they love. Um, yes, my name is Trevor Coopersmith. I have a bachelor's in art from UC Santa Barbara, and uh, I got accepted to an MFA program at the University of London Goldsmiths. So I was living in the UK for about six months, kind of realized it wasn't the right program for me. COVID happened, all this other crazy stuff, and, and I, I withdrew. So we could sort of talk about that later. But this might be of some help to people because if you're looking to get your MFA, uh, applying to schools, um, it's definitely a process of, of navigating, trying to figure out what program is going to work for you. And there's no easy answer to it. So hopefully I'll gain some insight onto like what's going on um, just in that whole process of trying to figure out why I get an MFA, should I even get one, you know, what program fits, et cetera. But more about that later. So just in general, I want to talk about uh, my experience as an artist, uh, I started painting when, when I was about 15. Uh, I do mostly spray paint work, uh, a bit of mixed media too, but I've been lucky enough to have commissions and sold pieces all over the world, um, been some public projects, and um, still, yeah, still just doing a bunch of outdoor festivals whenever things sort of start to open up. I've sort of dipped my feet into the, into the gallery world a little bit, but um, just want to talk about just general experience as an artist. Um, so I've worked with nonprofits around like the San Diego area, uh, helping out a, a wide variety of people, everyone from uh, like elementary school students, um, at risk teenagers, um, uh, victims of domestic abuse, people with special needs, every, everything you can sort of imagine. I've tried to um, at least get a feel for what my community is like and sort of go out of my way to help uh, those who might not have been as, as privileged as me. Um, so I do also do a lot of public affairs. Um, I get that background from my dad, who's a professional artist. So I'm pretty lucky I get to use a lot of his booth display and I understand the whole application process. I also manage his website and everything. Um, and then I also started a scholarship foundation to give back um, I give 350 every year to a high school student, so they send in an application. I sort of review it. Sometimes I get some crowdfunding, but it's mostly privately funded. Um, but I feel like it's sort of 
like as a whole goes into the, the public sector of things um, where I'm really interacting with a wide variety of people, um, selling my work that goes directly to the consumer's home and giving back to the community. I feel like everything sort of comes full circle. So to me, it's worth it to get involved in the public sector. Um, uh, the more like, I guess, private or more like for-profit part of the art world is maybe based on, you know, galleries, custom, commis com custom commissions, more like conceptual art, like having serious representation, exhibiting like internationally. And this is definitely something I would maybe like to get into a bit more and why I still want to get my MFA. But it's going to be, well, probably a lifetime worth of uh, trial and error. So I'm not quite there yet. But um, I mean, I've done a lot of commissions and I've worked in, with a lot of like philosophy and conceptual art forms and stuff. Um, but yeah, it's, I think it's important to check out both. But it's, but I guess why I'm sort of explaining like the two sides of this is it's sort of important for you to recognize what sort of artist do you want to be? Um, do you want to be out there doing art therapy or do you want to be in like a top gallery represented in Paris, you know? So whatever, whatever you want to do. Not like you can't do both, but um, you just got to ask yourself these questions. So regardless of which area you sort of want to like dive into in the, in the art world, and of course there's much more I haven't gone into, I'm just speaking from my experience, um, labor is going to be a huge factor with everything. So labor itself as an artist cannot exactly be, be quantified. I don't think so. Um, I mean, teach their own, but I don't think it's something that could be necessarily like broken down to like an hourly wage or a salary um, because being an artist is a very, um, I guess like volatile sort of industry. It's not something where you can expect to make money. Um, there's definitely like a pretty wide margin for um, artists. It's, it's not like um, being a teacher or uh, working as a nurse or something where it's usually pretty set in stone, like what the, what the base salary is. Um, in the art world, as everyone you know, you could be a millionaire or you could be poor. Uh, and die with nobody knowing your work and then you could become famous after. So it's, there's just a, a really wide spectrum. Um, but that being said, um, how do you, how do you quantify your work? Like how, what is your work worth? And obviously I'm, I'm a painter. Uh, I mostly do spray paint and oil pastel, but still, no matter what media you're working in, whether it's performance, sculpture, new media, um, how do you quantify what your your work is is worth? And um, so what I always kind of go by is not necessarily how long it, it took me, but the experience that I have, the amount of time I put into it. Um, you know, someone says, okay, how long did that painting take? I say, oh, it took, you know, a week. It took two weeks. But it didn't just take those, you know, 20, 30 hours within those two weeks. It took... Um, 10 years of trial and error, uh, the materials, the education I have, you know, the gas, picking up the, the supplies, the shipping, whatever it is. So there's a lot of external factors involved. Um, so I, I always say it took 10 years of practice plus the 20, 30 hours I put into it. Um, but yeah, you can sort of make up your own pricing and stuff. I like to make art really affordable. Um, I make some prints and stuff too, but I usually do original work. But it's important for you to think about what sort of uh, credentials do you have to sort of back up the high pricing? Um, is the gallery going to take a commission? Something like that. But it's important to know your worth. Don't sell yourself short. Um, and yeah, it's always really special when you find like a nice collector who wants to put your work in their, in their home or their office or something. It's a, it's a really rewarding thing. Um, but no matter what you're doing, you got to spend the time. Um, there's no shortcut to, to making good work. You just, you have to make good work. You have to put the time in. Um, it's a grind, it's a process, and it might, it might take your whole life to figure out what you want to do. But that's the whole point of being an artist is you, you can't just wake up and be famous. You just got to put in the work, whatever it is. Um, so within putting that work, you can maybe say, okay, art education is something I want to invest in. Uh, I went to community college uh, for three years. I saved up a lot of money. Um, and then I got my bachelor's at UC Santa Barbara. Uh, I loved it and I thought it was a great, great university. Um, the photo below um, is an exhibition that I had where I filled the whole gallery with sand, had a, 
a bunch of uh, international friends come by. It was a great time, sold some work. Um, it was like an immersive sort of experience um, that was important for me and very important in the whole education system is meeting people ideally from all over the world, uh, using the resources that the institution has, um, and then just having the, the degree. Uh, they also set me up with some internships and stuff, so that was quite nice. Um, some nonprofits, but it's not for everyone. I went to a large public university. Uh, there's other art schools like RISD, CalArts, uh, School, School of Art Institute Chicago that come to about usually roughly like $40,000 a year, but they're known to have some of the best art programs in the world. If you can afford it, go for it. It totally wasn't for me, um, but there's some great programs and it's obviously not guaranteed success, but a lot of these programs have really great track records of pumping out some of the greatest uh, designers and just artists in general in the world, uh, especially CalArts and RISD and School of Art Institute Chicago. They just have these long lasting reputations, um, everything from game design um, to fine art to video work. So there's a lot of options out there. You just got to do your research. Um, so I, I was really happy that I got my art degree from uh, UC Santa Barbara. Uh, then I went to University of London Goldsmiths. I took a few years off, applied and got it to a couple of schools, um, Goldsmiths being one of them. I went for it and figured out it wasn't for me. Um, we, we had strikes at our university and uh, my professors wouldn't really get in touch with me uh, during those time. And I felt very left out because I missed a lot of lectures and I really wasn't able to use all the resources that I was hoping for. Also, there was no teaching opportunities. I'd like to teach at the college level, uh, preferably community college because that's where I went, you know, went to school and it was a huge help for me. So that was another sort of factor for me. And then when COVID hit, I was like, I, I, I can't do this. I, I didn't want to be locked up in, in London. Um, and yeah, it just wasn't for me. It was also a fairly expensive school, about $20,000 a year. Um, some, maybe it's like mid-tier for how expensive it is just to get your MFA. But it was, um, it was just not the right fit for me. And so I, I withdrew and I'm in the process of trying to figure out where I want to go. So just in case anyone is curious, a master's of fine art is usually like the, the terminal degree for artists. Most U.S. institutions do not offer an MFA or sorry, a Ph.D. in uh, art. So the MFA is the terminal degree. It's sort of like a Ph.D., uh, sometimes two years, sometimes three years. Um, but there's a lot of really nice programs in the US. California has some of the best in, in my opinion, like UCLA is probably top tier UCI, even UC Riverside has a good program, Davis, a lot of the UCs and also smaller schools like Cal State Long Beach, uh, Northridge, they have pretty good programs. So it's just important to do your research, you can find the top rankings on US news. Um, but there's actually a lot of free MFA programs just in the US, uh, I think Indiana, Florida State University, uh, UT Austin, um, I think Washington, Oregon. And then also if you're living in California or any of like the, the sort of Western states that we have a pact for undergraduate and uh, most graduate degrees that you could pay in-state tuition so that covers most of the schools everywhere from Hawaii to Alaska to Washington, Oregon, all the way up to like New Mexico and Utah. So it's basically the left half, the Western half of the US um, has these uh, free or low cost uh, programs. At least you could get in-state tuition. So just do your research, you know, figure out what sort of faculty you want to work with. Um, there's other options too. You get a teaching credential or there's smaller drawing schools like atelier schools or, you know, you go to community college and just take some life drawing courses. So uh, internships, I had a good friend who interned with a pretty top artist in New York and he's doing really well. Um, so there's, there's options out there. It's important just to be flexible, but yeah, I'm trying to figure it out. Um, I, I got accepted to a school in Norway. It's a free program, which is nice. 
not totally sure if I'm going to go there. Um, still trying to figure that out. Um, yeah. So public art affairs is something I've been sort of like immersed in for the majority of my life. Um, so you set up a booth display, you go to public events, uh, you do like these sort of large scale festivals, um, sometimes smaller, you like little street fairs and stuff, but they usually happen about once a year, sometimes biannually. Um, it's really like heavily community based, which is really nice. Um, but of course it's dependent on the weather and it's an investment. So you got to not only make the work, but the booth display, um, I use pro panels. They work for me. Um, there's some sort of top tier, like large scale art festivals, you know, like more fine art affairs, like art and wine events and stuff. You might have to pay to get in. And then there's, you know, local little street fairs. And it's always important just to dip your feet in, test the water, see if it works for you. You know, it's not for everyone. Um, you can always sometimes rent a display if you don't want to commit. But um, my dad's been doing this professionally for the past I don't know, 40 years. He's still working at the age of 70. So it's, it's a lot of physical labor. Sometimes he has to hire people or, or <laughs> I'm forced to work with him. But um, it's worth it for us. It's, it's a total risk. Sometimes you show up, you don't make any money. Sometimes um, a few weeks later, someone will contact you wanting a commission. Sometimes people walk up and buy, you know, half the things in your booth. So you just, you never know. You can't plan for anything uh, <laughs> as an artist. So you never know, but it's worth it to me. Um, so of course these public art affairs have applications. Uh, you could find most of them on, or like Southern California ones are part of Kennedy and Associates it's called. Uh, but you could just look at your local city uh, website, see what sort of festivals they have. Uh, hopefully with COVID slowing down, more of that will open up. Um, people will be excited to get back outside and safely check out, um, yeah, the art event. So with these applications, um, whatever you're applying to, sometimes they have application fees and sometimes you have to pay for the booth. It's like I said, it's an investment, but these are just general tips for applications, everything from residencies to exhibitions to graduate school. So no matter what, you're going to need a professional looking portfolio. So you spend all this time making your work, you don't have good photos of it, you're, you're wasting your time. So crop out the edges, put a little white background, Photoshop it. It's, it's not that that tough. Um, you know, you, you, you don't have to rent a studio, you could use a little app on your phone to sort of Photoshop. I use this app called Union, U-N-Y-O-N. It's works with me, it was like three bucks. And I Photoshop a lot of work using that. I also have Photoshop. But, you know, pay someone a hundred bucks, a couple hundred bucks to just take some nice photos for the day. It's, it's worth it. If you, if you spend a long time making your work, it's worth it to get some good photos done. Um, it, it's just kind of goes without saying. Um, so also there's an artist statement that you want to make. Uh, usually I've learned to keep it short. The longer, the worse it is, you know, talk about why you became an artist, what sort of drives your work, what sort of conceptual frameworks back it, um, how you've sort of contributed to the greater art world and, you know, a short bio too, if, if it's necessary, some of your major um, accomplishments. You could somewhat punch into the statement, but it's usually a bit separate. Um, so the bio is sometimes shortened, can be condensed to about a paragraph. Um, it's important to have a good CV, have someone look it over, ask someone in, in university, you know, professor, your parents, your boss, whatever, have them look it over. But for my CV, I have um, a list of my exhibitions, my solo and group shows, uh, my teaching experience, public projects I've worked on. So it's, um, but I also condense it to about a page, page and a half. So like I said, it's important to keep things concise and to the point. No one looks, no one wants to look through a whole bunch of jumbled, you know, nonsense. Um, and then try to keep it, you know, your key accomplishments. There's certain exhibitions that I got accepted to that everyone gets accepted to. So I try to avoid putting those on my resume. Um, yeah, and any sort of relevant experience you have. Uh, so for most applications, you also need a statement of interest. So why are you applying to, to a certain thing? Um, you know, what, what sort of professors do you want to work with at school? Why do you want to work with this gallery? Um, how do you think your work will fit in? And what do you think you could gain from it? Um, yes, yeah, so that's important. 
So you can find a lot of open calls on Cafe, uh, Call for Entries, Art Connect's another one. There's a bunch of resources online. But at the end of the day, you always got to ask yourself, why do I want to be an artist? What's important about being an artist? <coughs> uh, excuse me. And why do you want to um, make work? And why do you want to work with them? So all these can be somewhat interconnected, but it's important to ask yourself that. Um, so the applications could be for residency. So like I said, I'm doing my first residency now. Um, so I'm living in Texas, College Station, kind of small rural town. Um, but it's a nice place for me to work because there's not a ton going on. Um, so you can travel. Some of the benefits of residencies are you can travel and live somewhere new. You can really dedicate your time to, to work. Um, you can interact with the community, which is really nice. Some residencies sort of like really emphasize that. Um, it can be quite competitive uh, to apply to these residencies and get in. Sometimes they only select one or two people. So it's a good, it's a really good resume builder. Um, some of them give a stipend. I, I received an apartment for three months and a $500 stipend and I get a, a solo exhibition at the end. So this was something great for me. Um, just do your research that the, um, the link that I left at the bottom is like a sort of Bible of residencies. Um, it's definitely uh, not for everyone. It's, it's kind of like the luxurious sort of side of the art world, but um, some of them are more nitty gritty and not super organized. You kind of have to submit your own, your own project, your own proposals to work with space, et cetera. But, um, you know, just like with school, just like with the galleries, just like any, anything else, it's, you know, where is your work going to fit in? And why do you want to work there? So it's the whole point of it is to make better work. So how are you going to improve and what can you give back to the community? I've, I've been volunteering a lot, uh, helping out with the nonprofit, helping at-risk youth out here. We went to Holocaust Museum and a little art gallery the other day. So what sort of impact can you make while you're there? Um, or it doesn't have to be with, with the community. It could be through like an ecological standpoint. So there's a lot of residencies that the National Park Service offers. You can check out on their website. Uh, those are great too. So public projects, I've been lucky enough to work for a handful of different cities when I was going to school and living in, in Carlsbad uh, most of my life. So I've done a lot of work in the community. I love it. I love giving back. I think it's super important. And you never know who will contact you after that to, to pick up some work. Um, so just, just try to get involved. It's, it's worth it. You, you can beautify your city. You can, um, show people the more like therapeutic aspects of the art world. Uh, you can participate in fundraisers, which I've done, especially memorial funds. Um, you, you know, it's just, it's just super important to, to do this stuff. Uh, want to improve your city, um, to gain some like actual experience, um, you know, collaborating with the city. There's a lot of you know, bureaucracy and sometimes things get slowed down a little bit. But once you get the green light to go, it's always worth it. So um, especially with nonprofits, helping them out, you know, it, it kind of just goes without saying. Um, art, art heals a lot. And my mission is to, to show people the benefits of, of art making. And I hope you have a somewhat similar intention. But at the end of the day, it is, it is nice to make some money. Um, so a handful of things uh, to go over because it's just one of the most important things about being an artist is how can I survive doing this? Um, what, you know, what sort of living could I do? And so I guess just from the, um, the perspective of an artist, you could say, okay, I want to be an art teacher, I want to work in a gallery, I want to be like a docent or a curator, um, a historian. So you could get a PhD in art history. Uh, that's an option. Uh, there's, a, there's frankly a lot you could do uh, with an art degree, but sometimes it could feel like there's maybe not <laughs> a ton of money out there. So you just, you just got to put in the work. Um, so I, I make a lot of my sales through Instagram and through just like public art events, which is why I like them so much. Um, you know, you could find some gallery representation, uh, that's maybe, that might be a little, a little bit later down the line. If you're trying to figure out, uh, what type of artist do you want to be? 
uh, you usually have to have a pretty solid body of work, um, especially with most of these applications and stuff, residencies. It's pretty tough to get in if you're just like completely starting out. They usually want to see like a track record of you working with other companies, working in, with uh, other residencies, um, to work with nonprofits, whatever it is. But it's important to get the experience, and that's why I say get involved in the city because you never know what sort of what sort of places it can take you. Um, so there's also music festivals. I know there's a big festival called Kabo in San Diego that they have a lot of artists participate, and a good amount of people come by. They have a couple of drinks, they listen to some good music, want to buy some art. So you never know. Um, uh, commissions are a big one. Uh, for me too, you know, I, I almost always give, give people an option, say like, hey, you know, what sort of colors do you want? What sort of subject do you want? What sort of canvas do you want wood? Do you want me to cut it a certain size, whatever? Uh, that's a nice way to make some, some money on the side. Um, and it's, it's usually really rewarding having your work like displayed in someone's home. And then it could always lead to, to more sales, which is nice. Uh, there's also the option to work for royalty companies. Um, I had my work printed for like a kind of small royalty company. I get like a small check every month or so. Um, so there's companies like Society6. The company I worked for was called Kess, K-E-S-S. And uh, it's an option. It's maybe could be more like, I guess, tacky if <laughs> some people want to want to label it that as like low art or tacky. But if you're making money and you're happy doing it, then go for it. Um, I mean, to, to each their own. But um, so the reason a couple, the reason I have a couple of these photos up here, one is the uh, Andy Warhol um, dollar sign. So Warhol's a, obviously a, one of those heavy hitters, but uh, he, he had like a whole factory worker of people working for him. And then he was also, um, big into the like design aspects and the, the marketing aspects of, um, of the art world. So he, uh, I think his famous quote is think rich and act poor. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's hard to think about commercializing your art without, without him. Um, but then the other picture I have, it says make good art and fantastic mistakes. Super important. You're going to mess up. You're going to make some horrible work. You're going to want to throw it away. Um, it's just part of the process. So that's just part of life and part of being an artist is you're going to do things that you kind of regret, but they're going to be little speed bumps and hurdles um, to get you hopefully to your, your final destination. Um, on that note, be wary of certain scams. Um, there's vanity galleries, they're called, V-A-N-I-T-Y. Vanity galleries are galleries that will contact you and say, hey, I, I want to show you work in New York or whatever. All you have to do is give me two grand, three grand and, and take care of all the marketing and then we'll do the rest. It's like, well, why, you know, what's the point of that? A lot of galleries usually take 30, 40, 50%. Um, but if it just go with your gut, if it doesn't feel right, don't do it. Uh, there's a lot of scams out there. So I'm going to end it on a, <laughs> on a cliche um, with a quote from Edward Hopper and it says, if you could say it in words, there'd be no reason to paint. Um, I think this sort of translates well to um, any, any form of art, uh, performance, sculpture, uh, new media, video. Uh, but for me, uh, art is my language, painting is my language. Um, to me, it doesn't matter if I'm using oil pastels or spray paint or acrylic squash, whatever it is. It's just, there's a reason I, I paint and there's a message that I want to get across. So you just got to find your voice as an artist and figure out what sort of message do you want to get across? I know that's easier said than done. It's kind of cliche, but it's a process. Do some reading, um, go to art galleries, do your art history. And you know, I left a handful of artists uh, down below for you to kind of check out. Um, say Edward Hopper, he did the famous uh, Nighthawk painting, the sort of evening piece at, at a cafe, like it's sort of iconic Americana, uh, mid 20th century. Alexander Hogue, um, he did some pretty interesting work called regionalism, sort of fits around that time period, like early mid 20th century. Uh, Ken Price, uh, a bit more contemporary stuff. Uh, but I, I really like his work. 
Uh, he's also a sculptor too. He does these crazy like organic sort of wavy forms. George O'Keefe, incredible painter as well, influenced a lot by the Southwest. So it's important just just do your research, find out some influences. Um, like I said, it's a process, but just put yourself out there, um, educate yourself, uh, and feel things out. Not everything is going to be as black and white as you think. So it's it's a process. You just got to be flexible, open to change, open to things not working out in your favor. But that's just how life works. So hopefully you can be positive and make the most of things. So thank you guys for listening.